Biggest mistake entrepreneurs make is they don't replicate themselves soon enough. They don't put in the financial controls, separating their own personal finances from their business finances. And they don't set up their businesses to be attractive one day to a buyer. Right. Not that you have to sell your business, but if you truly want to architect it so that you can step out of working in the business or being the rainmaker, it's very important to start with that strategy um, to build your business in a sustainable way that it can live without you. If you put off the tough conversation, it just sits here on your shoulders. It sits in the back of your mind. It gnaws away at you. It worries you. It's incomplete business. So going towards the pain, embracing it, that to me is true leadership. That's authentic leadership. And in my experience, the entrepreneurs that do that are the entrepreneurs that are highly competent. Hello, and welcome back to the Better Human Podcast, a podcast about making humans better humans and demystifying the world of relationships, communication, and entrepreneurship for your better life. Today, we're joined by Sean McGinnis. CEO of Capital 54, a firm dedicated to investing growth capital and managing boutique professional services firms from scale to exit. You and I met, which was very cool not too long ago, and I started asking you some personal questions about my business. We're going to get into that as well today. Sean started his career out in South Africa. He's a fellow South African. He's worked with one of the country's most productive sources of agriculture chemicals. He also ran professional services firm 14 years, which he grew to encompass operations in Canada, the US and Mexico. Sean has also served as the global president of EO, Entrepreneurs Organization, which is an incredible organization. And we're here to uh, gain some of your knowledge, get your expertise, get some nuggets and ask you all these sorts of questions. Welcome to the show, Sean. I'm really excited to be here. And the fact that we are lunch one, as they say in the classic. Uh, fellow South Africans, um, and I did have the distinct privilege and honor of meeting your dad. So, you know, I'm a little older with a little gray hair, but um, that was that was a while back. I forgot about that. You told me about that when we first met, and that's what uh, 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 that was a deep connection. I totally, totally forgot about that. Right? Well, how how funny is it how how life becomes circular and uh, evolving? Right? Yeah, it's well, pretty remarkable. Right. So when I immigrated to to Canada uh, in 1989, you know, I didn't dream that I'd end up where I was today. And I think that's something that hopefully we can discuss today is that whole entrepreneurial journey right. and how you start and where you are in the middle and hopefully how you end. It's right. uh, you never know. Let's jump right into it. Let's start right there. So, I mean, you, by definition, are an extremely successful entrepreneur. You've built businesses. You've scaled them. You've sold them. You're still killing it. You're in your third round or fourth round, I think, in uh, business yeah. right now. And, you know, I mean, when people left South Africa, you know, mid to late 80s, there was a mass exodus. exodus. Yeah. And I'm sure, as you knew, you weren't allowed to take out your money. You weren't allowed yeah. to, 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 to leave with, with wealth. So when you decided to leave, you know, as most of us did, you, you know, my father, big risk. Um, you come to Canada, or well, in some cases, people went to Australia. I don't know how I ended up in Canada. You ended up in a nice warm climate in the US. But, uh, you know, you, you, you leave with nothing and you got to start over. So let's start right there. I mean, that's a scary, scary yes. time. Talk to me about sort of what was it like for you to sort of come across the pond? And what were those first few, a few years like? Well, firstly, a huge shout out to Canada, you know, an incredibly welcoming um, environment. Um, you know, the Canadian government structure was extraordinarily helpful. You know, just the basics of getting all of your your paperwork and all of that was, was seamless. In fact, I still am so proud when I see the Canadian logo, and I know this isn't about Canada, but the it's a very different experience than I've had elsewhere. I mean, it was extraordinarily welcoming. Secondly, I, I was blessed with having some really good contacts. I'd never been to Canada before, so I arrived with my paperwork. I chose to live in Vancouver because I had this idealized and correct impression that Vancouver was a beautiful part of the world to live in. And I had a couple of names, some old pals of my dad, um, who was, they were at Bits University together. And literally, they opened up their arms to me, introduced me to, he introduced me to his family. And um, so I had somewhat of a soft landing. I had three or four weeks of accommodation um, and obviously their network to tap into. And fortunately, we connected. I'd never met them before, but as luck would have it, um, we had so many things in common and they were so gracious 
Um, and, you know, I'd been trained well. My mother taught me well. So, you know, I picked up things. I cleaned up after myself. I helped out. I washed dishes and, you know, I made myself useful. And I think that is, you know, that's a lesson that I've carried throughout my life, not taking things for granted and not um, just expecting handouts. Mm -hmm. So they were very, very, you know, helpful. Um, they, um, I had an idea to start a business. My father had acquired the rights and his business partners to a suite of psychometric and behavioral psychology tools in South Africa called Thomas. Mm -hmm. And I had a vision to acquire the Canadian rights, but it was, it was a dream. It wasn't a reality. I was 25 years old. But um, shortly after arriving, um, I called the Thomas people in England um, and expressed a desire to take a territory, as it, as it were. And that's how I started. Um, and literally my first account was a company called Kaminko Metals. I'll never forget it. I still have the invoice for 6,000 Canadian dollars. Wow, back, um, back in 1990, um, head of human resources, Jim Richmond, fine human being, took me under his wing, um, believed in what I was doing, gave me a shot. And um, that, was, that was the start. In fact, he even loaned me an overhead projector uh, for about uh, six months that I would lay out my slides and do my training. So, Greg, that's back in the day before right. the internet. Right. I mean, <laughs> what's funny is, as you said, overhead projector, I remember early days in training was having a big folder with your, uh, uh, what, what what they called, not translucence, um, uh, your overheads, the actual... Yes, the overhead slides. The, the yeah, slides, but they were printed on this, like, uh, can't even... Form of plastic. <laughs> exactly. And you would be shuffling them on. And in a lot of cases, you would put them upside down. You'd be like, oh, I'm so sorry. Let me spin that around and <laughs> let me go ahead and focus that. And it was like real manual, uh, manual uh, production and presentation. But let's go back there. So how old were you when you came uh, to Canada? I was 25. Were you married? Did you have kids? No, I was single. Uh, and I stayed single for a long time until I was 34. I got very, very engaged in building my business. Right. I had to teach myself selling. Um, I had to teach myself a brand new culture. Right. And I had to hustle uh, because your earlier point, you know, we didn't have any resources. We couldn't bring any money out. I was very fortunate in that I was able to, after a year, having proved myself, take a loan. Um, and, uh, you know, from, um, from the South African group, actually, who were incredibly supportive mm -hmm. and who were mentors. You know, my father and his partner um, were, were really... They weren't hands-on, but they believed in uh, what I was attempting to do. And uh, I gave them about a 5X on their money, by the way. So it was very well worth their while. Good investment. So, you know, you, you've said a few things, and I just want to sort of back up. I mean, you're a young guy. You, you've come here. You have an opportunity to take over the licensing of Thomas International. And just for, for sort of the audience, that's the DISC assessment. Right. Yes. So it is one of the most uh, well-known assessments out there. I mean, whether whether we want to get into the merits of, 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 of the actual assessment, that's not the conversation. But it is if you're in the training world, if you're in the coaching world, if you're in HR, there's like a what 99 percent chance that you have touched the disc yes. assessment. So you come here, you're, you're young, you're, as they say, bright eyed and enthusiastic, uh, full of uh, energy and willingness to take risk. Um, I believe entrepreneurship has a lot to do with community and without community, it's very difficult to be an entrepreneur. Yes. How, and you, you've made some good, uh, you said some key things there, which is like, you really wanted to show up well in, in these relationships and you wanted to yes. respect these relationships and you wanted to do as much as you can to give into it. Do you think you would have had the success you've had today without the intention of putting value into a community or, you know, giving uh, back to, to people? No, I don't think I would have. And I was never a volunteer. I didn't really understand the value of community until, um, until I arrived in Canada. Um, well, I did in, in, a, in, in more of a philosophical sense because my father had been in business, my mother had, and they had longstanding relationships and had both been, you know, very hardworking people uh, who started with, you know, in a very humble way, like a lot of our families do. But that the essence of recognizing early just how important people are and their contributions, and then not just being a taker, um, but showing up to give back, um, you know, it's a tried and tested philosophy. And I would encourage your audience to start by looking really carefully at themselves, because success is not a, it's not an individual endeavor. 
there is nobody that I've met that's been successful, whether it's in business or whether it's in teaching or whether it's in any aspect of life that hasn't had a contribution. Um, and the really successful ones understand that giving and helping others is a stepping stone to receiving more than you would ever, ever imagine. Right. And a lot of people, Greg, along my way from the Reed family in the United Kingdom to Doug Caldwell at the Caldwell Partners to Charles Rowlandson and Brian McGinnis. And the list is, you know, the list is long. And then I happen to be very, very blessed to meet Peter Thomas, who is the Canadian founder of Century 21 and really a Canadian legendary businessman. Mm -hmm. And Izzy Sharp, who was the um, who was the founder of the Four Seasons Hotel Group, a legend in Toronto. I attended a YPO event. Um, actually, it wasn't a YPO event. It was an EO event hosted by these two YPOers very early in my career in Toronto. And I joined the, the founding board of the Toronto chapter of EO, the Entrepreneurs Organization. And, um, you know, that was my springboard. And Peter Thomas... I've intersected with throughout my entire career and is still a friend. And, um, you know, it was his and Izzy Sharp's, um, I guess, business example. They were hosting a group of young entrepreneurs and basically paying it forward by saying, getting into a community can be a force multiplier in your business life. And instead of making the mistakes that we made, You'll be with a group of people, you'll have access to a group of mentors, you know, elder states, men and women in business who can really help you along the way. And that lesson I learned early and um, I was able to leverage it really, really well. I joined with people in, in, that, in, in Toronto like Jeff Dennis. I don't know if you've had Jeff on your show. No, um, great business know. guy. <laughs> uh, Kingsley Ward, um, another very successful um, business person. Elizabeth Huggins, um, you know, these were sort of early Ken Priestman. These were early people um, who I was in communication with Sven Grail, Robert Powell. I'm th throwing out these names, Murray Klein. These were all people in my 20s um, who I would never have, the, have had the benefit of meeting or learning from. And they were extraordinarily um, giving um, they were all battling to build their own businesses and their lives and their families. And it was, um, that was my start, Greg, that, that really opened my eyes to the benefit of community. What's amazing about what you've just described is, is, is the, your ability to rhyme off all of those names so clearly as if, as if you were seeing them yesterday. Yeah, 30 years, 30 years ago. So what were some of your biggest fuck ups and mistakes that you've made early in your career? So, you know, very early on, sort of three years in, I ended up selling two thirds of my business to a publicly traded company. I, I was still the president of the business. Um, the for four years wasn't a mistake. I didn't think it was a mistake, um, but there were some commitments made and there were some um, obligations that um, in my view, and there's always three different sides to a story, by the way, weren't, um, weren't fulfilled. Um, so I think I, 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 got a, I got a significant partner too early. And the, the goals were not aligned. I had my goals. They had their goals. It ended up actually quite well because I, I purchased back their two-thirds um, with the help of another extraordinary Canadian businessman, Jerry Maravitz. And, um, you know, we embarked on, on the next phase of that journey. So I think the biggest mistake was I, I just was too early in my own development as an entrepreneur. The company was at its early phase of development. It, you know, it had you know, half a million dollars in sales and trending towards a million. But, you know, it, it took away some of the freedom and the creativity to do the kinds of things that a true entrepreneur really wants to do. Now, there's two sides to that. You know, it also put me on the map. Right. I'm incredibly grateful for that, really extraordinarily grateful. But it was an early lesson. And I think advisors taking the wrong, you know, taking advice from some people that were really more about themselves than about the business, the people in the business and a true plan for that particular business. Mm -hmm. And so that was an early lesson. Be careful who you take advice from. Mm -hmm. Make absolutely certain that the people you're getting mm -hmm. advice from are, you know, subject matter experts. And you get several different opinions so that you can triangulate things for yourself. Um, and, um, you know, that was, that was key. Uh, so those early lessons, 
They didn't have a significant financial downside, in fact, quite the opposite, but they had a psychological downside. And it took me a while to recognize that, you know, very importantly, knowing yourself in business and isn't as an entrepreneur is key. Because if the drum that you're and the beat that you're marching to isn't your own, one day you'll wake up and recognize that there's a misalignment. And if you can't get through that, a lot of people crash and burn at that point. Right. Again, fortunately, I didn't crash and burn. You know, partnerships are very difficult. Marriage is very tricky. Is, is very difficult, right? So, you know, I think what I heard you say, and it's so true, one about the advisors, which is, you know, in our effort to succeed, sometimes we're grasping so quickly for advice and guidance and yes. don't really consider the, 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 the messenger on the other end, right? I had this conversation the other day about, you know, mentorship, which is, you know, what's, you know, you know, how do you know someone's really here to mentor you? And one of the comments that was made was you know they're not trying to win they've already won right they've already won and they their, their orientation is to help you so right. their skin in the game is your success it's not their success right and believe it or not i've had a lot of mentors and they say they get just as much back but they don't go into it to get that back right mm -hmm. So tell me a little bit about, I mean, so uh, you, uh, we've spoken about community, you know, tell me a little bit about some of the influential people in your life. Um, you know, we all have them who have been, we, we, we've spoken about maybe some bad advisors that we've had, but let's flip that. Who have been some strong mentors and advisors for you or, you know, thought leaders that you've, you've followed and it's helped you um, continue scaling your businesses and being successful? So, I, you know, I started, I, I mentioned my parents, both of them were entrepreneurs, um, both of them were extraordinarily hardworking, they're both deceased, unfortunately, but, you know, watching them as an example um, was really key, because I learned early on that nothing comes without rolling up your sleeves, putting in the effort, long hours, weekends, my mom was in real estate, uh, she was on the residential side, and then was a, um, a really very, very gifted renovator of historical monuments in South Africa. My father um, was, um, he started an office furniture manufacturing business called Anglo Dutch in South Africa with a Dutch partner and worked, they worked unbelievable hours and really, really hard. And yes, they, you know, they, they, they benefited from their hard work, but nothing was too small for them. So my parents, number one, um, you know, I have been very, again, very blessed, Greg, I have a best friend that I met at seven years old. I went to boarding school at seven. And the young man who was in the bed next to me, his name was Grant Trevel. Um, we're still friends today. You know, I'm 56 years old. Um, and since the age of seven, we speak once a month. We are very tight. 50 years. Uh, he lives in South Africa. We have each other's backs. He had my back more than I had his growing up because he was a big guy. <laughs> I suddenly had a growth spurt later on. Because, you know, you grow up fending for yourself. And, you know, that was another huge gift for me. And then we, we align both, both on values and spirituality and the, the outlook we have on life. And we'll speak about, you know, the essence of humanity. But, you know, having that relationship, it's almost like you know that there's always somebody in your corner. Um, and, you know, I wish for everybody that they had that kind of relationship. I've and then, you know, my, 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 my wife and daughter fill that role now as well. But, and then thirdly, um, you know, my current um, business partner, um, uh, Greg Alexander, who we're on, a, this is my, my fourth sort of phase and his sort of second phase. Um, he had a very successful exit, built, in, built a professional services firm and sold it for very high nine figures, um, close to $170 million all cash. Wow. Um, and he's very inspirational. You know, he's a person that if I had met 25 or 30 years ago, I would have probably treated business differently. And I'll, I'll explain some of that a little later. But I'm so enjoying his energy and his learning, uh, my learning from, from him. And that's the other thing. I think all of these people that I mentioned have been lifelong learners, highly curious, and not sort of, um, they didn't have a hubris of their own. So they weren't sort of focused on their own um, talents and, you know, their own importance or their own success. They remained curious throughout their lives. They still remain in, in, in the instances that I've just described. Um, and they're willing to make mistakes. Um, so those have been, I mean, there have been business, there have been many, as you've, you're probably clearly getting. Right. Um, 
I have benefited from a lot of help and a lot of great people. We got to be very conscious and careful of who we surround ourselves with. And then, you know, as I've listened to you talk about this stuff, I, I'll just sort of, you know, paraphrase and repeat, you know, um, I think what you've just really expressed is the importance of being conscious and aware of how you're showing up in a community and relationships, being very uh, living, living the position or the value of service in those relationships and giving, right? Uh, yes. You know, receiving help, I think, is a big one. A lot of people don't receive help or they're unable to ask for help nowadays. Yes. I don't know what it is. You know, the other thing is, is you know, I love what you talk about, that whole concept of hard work. I come from that, which is get exactly. your hands dirty. Like, j there, there is no job that is too small. Like, just do it all. And yes. Well, and I used to say this a lot. I don't care whether you flip burgers or you're a CEO, but if you're a burger flipper, you are the best burger flipper in town. You are That's absolutely right. You are rocking. You know, my, my brother and I, who my brother was in business with me for many years and now has his own business, <clears throat> still, still in the human resources area. And we were reminiscing recently. My dad, when he drove us to school in the morning before going to boarding school, he used to have this little refrain, he used to sing this little song, do what you do, do well, boys. Mm. You know, and that was kind of, we get out the door, you know, and you had this refrain in your mind, do what you do, do well. And then, you know, the reality, life is messy. You know, none of us is perfect. You know, um, the great God made us um, to be um, imperfect. Um, and, you know, that's a, that, that to me is also very important to understand because, we need people in particularly in business, you know, if you're not detail uh, oriented, hire somebody that is because the details are very important. Right. Rolling up your sleeves is very important. And then bringing in people that have those same philosophies is key. Otherwise, it becomes frustrating. And there's nothing more frustrating than being in a business, working hard and not enjoying what you're doing. And a large part of that, Greg, as you know, is who you surround yourself, who you hire. Um, who you who you borrow money from in the case of banks or or lenders, etc. Okay. On that note, we're going to take a break and we're going to come back and we're going to explore that a little more. Okay. Just before we jump into the next segment, we're going to take a quick little audio break and we're going to hear from our sponsor, the Better Human Program. The Better Human Program is a 10-week program that equips you with the tools to achieve success in every interaction with other humans. Learn assertiveness, effective communication, interpersonal skills, and take control of your life with the Better Human Program. Check out the link below for all the description information. All right, so welcome on back. We are getting into the deep dive section. The objective of today is to get a little more expertise from uh, Sean. Uh, we've just heard about sort of, you know, the importance of community, the importance of get, receiving help, the importance of hard work, and more importantly, you know, um, being able to, to, to take the right advice and the right mentorship. So now we're going to go a little deeper with that. Sean, I want to talk a little bit about, or the first question I want to kick off with is um, the big one that we're here to talk about, which is how how do we successfully build and scale a business? So, you know, what are some of the, the, actually, let's start with the myths, right? So what are some of the right. myths when it comes down to, to scaling a business? So, you know, I think the, for me, it's, you can't, you know, a lot of people say you can't create wealth in certain businesses. You know, there was this myth that said, you can't run a fee-based professional services business like yours in training and make significant generational wealth. Well, that's totally not the case. If you look at the top four consulting firms, mm -hmm. McKinsey, Bain, Accenture, um, you know, Ernst & Young, they didn't start being Ernst & Young. They started with a person that had a vision that was, you know, billing themselves out on an hourly basis. And look at the valuation of those companies today. For sure. You know, Accenture is probably the most acquisitive company in the world today because they've amassed the kind of um, of, um, of, of wealth and, and the kind of, of capital to invest in those types of businesses. So, you know, and you can look at any business that an entrepreneur finds and, you know, there are there are more naysayers than there are yes sayers. Now, there's a way to get there. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you're willing to follow the process and you're willing to do the work, there is not a business in my view where you can't make generational wealth. Okay. And it's not about the money. It's about having enough to do what you're, you know, what you want to do. If you want to give it all away, great. If you want to keep a lifestyle business, great. But that is a myth. 
Yeah, but I think, you know, to your point, uh, one of the key things, uh, at least one of my drives in life is to create financial security and wealth for my children and right. hope to create enough wealth that like, you know, their children can can uh, uh, be supported. And, you know, Warren Buffett, you know, did this very well where he said, you know, I'm not going to leave my kids all my money, but I'm going to leave them enough that they're going to be well off, but not enough where they're not going to do anything at all. Yes. Uh, and I kind of feel the same way. So, you know, let's go back to to that. How what are some of the things you mentioned process, right? So, mm -hmm. you know, what is the process we need to follow? I'm in a training and consulting business, right? I'm sort right. Of now thinking about well, where am I going in the next five years, 10 years, 15 years and 20 years? What are some of the things I should be thinking about doing? Where, where, where would I begin? What would you suggest? How should I start? Well, in your case, I mean, you already know who you are. And for those of your listeners, you know, it's really important to know what, who you are, what your strengths are, what your weaknesses are, yeah. what your long term goals are, um, and never lose, lose sight of those, you know, your values, how you want to, how you want to engage, um, and how you want to be engaged with that's a foundation. Once you've got your business plan and your business idea, it's a matter of testing it on a regular basis. I mean, you've got a going concern business. Mm -hmm. I'm sure not all of it is working the way that you would like it to work. So, you know, it's taking stock on a regular basis. So I advocate, and there's a, there's a great operational methodology out there. Vern Harnish started his, it was called Traction. Um, you know, you've got this really great, um, uh, yeah, there it is, scaling up. Um, which is brilliant. You've got Gino Wickman who wrote Traction um, and who developed the EOS operating system. The reason an operating system is really key because it holds you accountable to achieving your goals. Building a successful business is about doing small steps well. It's about testing your thesis and your hypothesis and doing you know, experimentation along the way. It's about getting your pricing right, getting your product and service mix right. And those are not static elements. Those are highly active elements. It's deciding where you want to play. Do you want to be a high price, high value, you know, um, producer? Do you want to be in the middle range? Do you want to be a commodity? You know, are you an intellectual business where you're using your own specific unique capability? There are a lot of amazing, very qual high, highly qualified scientists or experts in health or technology or engineering or architecture, if you've got those basic skill sets and you want to become an entrepreneur, that's probably going to inter, you know, leverage your intellectual capital. Then there are the wisdom businesses where you're basically hiring a bunch of people that can do certain work better, cheaper, faster um, than somebody else, but they have some unique qualification and unique ability. And then there are the methodology businesses. I literally was on, in my first business I, I was a licensee. I had a, a methodology business. Now, I was able to turn that into a business where we built a consulting arm, we built an executive recruitment arm. Um, but those are the those are the areas that you need to get right in the beginning. Once you've got those foundational elements there, and you're starting to, you know, get a sense of or, or get the 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 tempo of results, the tempo of sales delivery understanding that becomes even more important because then you have to sustain it. You have to professionalize it, systematize it so that it's replicable. Right. Because the, the biggest mistake entrepreneurs make is they don't replicate themselves soon enough. They don't put in the financial controls, separating their own personal finances from their business finances. And they don't set up their businesses to be attractive one day to a buyer. Right. Not that you have to sell your business, but if you truly want to architect it so that you can step out of working in the business or being the rainmaker, it's very important to start with that strategy um, to build your business in a sustainable way that it can live without you. Because if you drop dead tomorrow, Greg, God forbid, you know, could the business continue? That's a question yeah. that, you know, I think it's very important to pose to people when they build something. Build to last. So personally, I mean, this is something that I, I think about a lot. So could the, if I get hit by a bus tomorrow, could my business, would my business continue? In some regards, no, because right. I am Greg Witz. However, however, we have significant amount of trainers and coaches. Um, we have a methodology, we have IP, we have the assessment, we have, you know, materials, copyright. So someone can pick that up. But, you know, what, what kind of freaks me out a little bit would be who? Yes, precisely. Succession. Succession. And building that in, having your right hand and having maybe multiples that you're grooming and developing. 
right. because at some point you want to give them the opportunity right. you know to create generational wealth you know it's it's so important you look at bill gates's giving pledge and the high caliber of people in those businesses that are giving their fortunes away buffett is a perfect example and you look at the businesses he's invested in the people the leaders he's invested in you know you don't necessarily have to be a sole proprietor in order to create generational wealth, you could be an intrapreneur, a hired gun with an entrepreneurial mindset and have skin in the game and build shares and stock options. And there are different ways to skin the cat. Right. I would say that the fundamentals for anybody like you and I is, is your business, you know, does it have, you know, significant stable cash flow? Right. And does it have the profit profitability? To enable you to do a number of things, either reinvest in your business, start something else, invest outside of your business, you may decide, oh, I'd like to go into real estate investing, you know, where I can put my money to work and get a 10, 12% pressure on an annual basis, but then grow some stability outside of the core business, lay off risk in a number of different areas. You can only do that if you're running a really well cash flowing and profitable business. Look, I think, you know, what, 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 what we're discovering is, you know, everyone wants to be an entrepreneur. Everyone, in some cases, thinks it's easy. But, you know, as we began, you know, it starts with community, starts with hard work. And as we start to level up into the world of, of being an entrepreneur and scaling business, there are a number of finite little things that we got to be masters of, right? We got to be masters at sort of yes. financial cash flow and operations yes. and vision and, you know, sales and I modeling people. and recruiting and recruitment and taking the right kind of risk you know you got to have that little bit of that gambling side in your personality as well so you know there's a lot of different pieces that really have to come together in order for that individual to actually be successful and i think you know we could learn to be entrepreneurs we could learn to be business uh, business folks 100 percent. and i think the best learning is not necessarily business learning i'm a big fan of of um getting a, a good foundation going to university, um, studying. I think that's very important. And today in the virtual world, you know, you can do a lot of that online successfully. There's no comparison to learning while doing. You know, um, I'm back, you know, looking after two portfolio companies that we've invested in. And I'm also carrying a quota, a business development quota. Mm -hmm. You cannot survive in business unless you're prepared to go out and sell. You know, so I say the number one, you know, thing to learn is, you know, if you as the owner, I'm not saying you have to be the best salesperson. I'm certainly not the best. There are way more qualified and capable people. But carrying a quota is very important because it shows, again, it's showing up. It's believing in whatever you're doing, your product or service. And it's, you know, it's contributing to the bottom line. I think, I don't think I'll, I, you know, I think I'll go into the ground uh, or be sprinkled on the ocean, um, still carrying a quota. Um, and I think that's important. Even when I was in the nonprofit realm for seven and a half years, I took great satisfaction in bringing in as many new YPO members into YPO as I could. Right. Um, because, and the same with EO, and I'm still referring people because I know what the engine is that make, makes things go run. And it's not handouts, folks. It's hard work and it's generating. Unfortunately, the world we, we live in, it's generating income in order to pay for the things we do. So carrying a quota is really, really key. And I love it, the thrill of that. You know, um, I was missing it for, for quite some time and I'm loving it at the moment because introducing people to something that you know works and that's really solid and it's got strong foundations and it's well backed, there's nothing like it. It's very thrilling. What you talk about is sales, right? Let's just, I mean. Yeah, sales, absolutely. And the word sales is sometimes received as a little bit of a dirty word, right? Oh, it's not at all. It's, it makes I, the world go round. I, I agree. You know, <laughs> the, the, there's a great quote that um, an old friend who I've lost touch with, but uh, his father used to say, no money, no honey, right? Yes, yes. Uh, um, I also got some mentorship where uh, I was part of a, a peer uh, CEO group also, similar to like a YPO EO, but uh, a competitor. Uh, yes. And they used to say, you know, cash is king. If you don't know your money by uh, what, what your cash flow looks like on the 10th of each month, you're fucked. You have to know, you have to know your money. And, you know, again, you, you know, as an entrepreneur, you can't cut corners. And it's not only knowing your money, it's also paying your taxes. 
It's doing all of the all of those things that are important that are sustainable. And you can't cut corners in that regard. And I would, you know, if you're not making money in a business and you're not prepared to do the hard work and get all of the baseline operational things right, then you're in the wrong business or you're not cut out for it. And that's fine. Yeah. So let me ask you that. So new entrepreneur starts a business, they're running into it. They're, uh, as we know, you know, what do they say? You don't make any money the first year, the second year, hopefully you make a little bit more where like you could just yep. you know, cover things third year, hopefully you could pay yourself. Like what's the timeline? Like if I'm starting a business and I'm not making money and I'm doing all these things, you know, how do I now start to assess and evaluate whether I'm in the right business? Like when do I quit? You know, that's a, that's, Great. And a lot of people don't know when to quit. They keep beating, you know, they keep beating something that's, right. you know, lost because they, they believe in it. It's theirs. They have this passion. You know, I, it's a, it's a big, broad question. And really the answer is it depends. It depends on the market. It depends on the type of product, depends on the customer. That's why having this, these 90 day periods. And in fact, weekly, you know, weekly, we run in right now, all our businesses, we pivot weekly. We have a psychographic and a demographic profile of our customer. Who's buying? What's selling? Is price a barrier? Where are you getting your objections? If you're not selling something within the first two or three months of your business, that's an indicator. That's a red flag. But understanding those red flags, that's why it's so important to lay everything out, almost, almost like a blueprint, Greg, where you literally define every week, how am I doing against these particular goals? Were my assumptions about my market correct? You know, if I'm in manufacturing, is my supply chain working effectively? Is the quality of my product going to be sustainable or am I going to have to deal with returns? Right. If it's a service that you're selling, you know, is it, um, is it well received? And are you getting feedback from your customer? But one of the worst things I see in failed businesses, people forget to ask their customers, how am I doing? Is right. my product filling the need? You know, who else out there is doing what I'm doing and what can I learn from them? So competitor analysis is not just a phrase. It's not just a nice to have. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're a first mover, great. You know, you've got this huge advantage. But so many things in life today have already been done. They may not have been done as well, or you may, you may have built a better mousetrap. Mm -hmm. But all of those little things, you know, there's a Bible, there's a startup owner's manual um, that that is you know, I would recommend everybody to, to read. It's called the Startup Owner's Manual. And it is well-researched. It's done by some of the leading academics and business people. And there's some just basic foundational things that everybody needs to go, go through. And it's not a one-off. It's a continuous process. That's a living it's like your business, right? You know, you know what you do in your business. You've done extraordinary, extraordinarily well in training. You've got your podcast. You've got your following but it's never evergreen. You've got to constantly tweak, evolve, and adapt. Every single day. Every like single so. day. Right. And intentional about it. And also then when you delegate, Greg, right. delegating to people that you trust and that you're paying to do certain things, you've got to check on them because not, you know, it's, again, it's that repetitive cycle. Right. So, you know, I like what you said there, which is people. So let's float into that. You know, yes. how important is it for us to have measurements, checks and balances, uh, metrics to hold our people accountable to. Uh, to oh, it. it's it's critical. You can't run a business without metrics and without data. Right. And the and the trickiest variable in any business is people, because people require motivation. They require a a good and fair income. In sales, a lot of salespeople are motivated by reward and recognition, both financial as well as psychological. Right. Um, there are some people where money isn't a motivator, and there are some roles in an organization that don't require necessarily the kind of incentive programs, but people are the lifeblood of a business. Right. You know, humanity is, you know, we're the sentient beings. And, you know, it's so important to get the people component right. So, you know, making sure that there's a solid alignment to your business values, um, to you know, making sure that individuals are very clear on their goals, very clear on the measurement requirements. Right. And that that takes work. And it's it, if you don't get that aspect, you can never get it right because it's always a wrinkle. Mm -hmm. um, it's never going to end up quite the way you'd like it to. Right. But as long as you're communicating transparently, 
as long as the goals are clearly and mutually understood, as long as you're checking in on a regular basis, and as long as people recognize, you know, there's three things. There's the competence to be able to do the role. Right. So you've got to hire people that actually have a proven competence to do it. Now you'll take a chance on junior people and you'll build them and nurture them. So if the person doesn't have a desire to show up, you know, and really be in the game uh, or on the court, as they say, that's a problem. And then, you know, are they, are they literally doing um, what they're saying, you know, what they have said and what they've signed up to do? And that's your measurement and, and making sure that you're tracking towards your goals. Three very simple things. And you've got to check that on a continuous basis. Right. You know, the once a year performance review or the one say every six months, you know, those are big corporate related things and lots of people, but you've got to check in almost daily, um, particularly in a small startup or an entrepreneurial endeavor. Very key. You know, I, I had this conversation with the leader the other day. I said, the most important thing you can do right now is just give some FaceTime. Go FaceTime, have, pretty cool. Right, go go meet them every day because, you know, you eventually you build your business to a stage where it gets bigger and then the definition is more successful and you now want to sort of, you know, layer in that leadership. But at the end yeah. of the day, some of these people, you know, all they need is access. All they need is time and connection. And, and candid, Greg, straight right. communication, not you know, not beating about the bush and because people want to know actually. Right. When, when I've had conversations with team members and staff and people that I've worked with, you know, feedback that I got early in my career was, well, you know, you're not coming to the point. You're kind of waffling around the issue. I used to do that a lot as well, like early. Yeah, because we like to be liked, right? right. Um, and I also know I'm aggressive. So I'm like, well, let me, let me, I'm an entrepreneur and I'm a leader and I have to, I have to, and in that, in that, my biggest mistake, I was, if I was to say, one of my early, early, early mistakes, and, and in some cases, if I'm not careful, I still make it stay because, uh, you know, old ha habits are hard to break. Yes. Is I effort to deliver the message in a way which is soft and supportive. We don't end up delivering the message. And for me, as long as you're respectful, you can deliver bad news respectfully. You can be pragmatic and you can be candid. Right. Um, and that that goes a long way because it just cuts through the noise. Right. And people want that. People want, people want that realistic uh, measurement. Where have I fucked up? Where am I not doing well? Where am I doing well? Like, don't do the positive sandwich nonsense. Right. <laughs> No. And if you're checking in daily, then you should be able to be able to give this realistic, timely feedback and treat it like right. a, 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 a living, breathing performance review. I agree. You know, once a year, half a year, that's for big corporate when you're running a group of 40 plus people. What are some of the best resources that have helped you along the way uh, in which individuals can benefit? I, I said it, I touched on it a little bit, but it's finding the best people knowledgeable truly experts in the particular area you're looking for a resource. So, you know, if I'm looking for a, a lawyer to do patents or trademarks, right. I'm going to go to a verified patent and trademark attorney who knows their game. I'm going to pay the money. I'm not going to try and make it up. I'm not going to try and print it off the internet and do it myself because it just doesn't work, folks. So for me, it's find the person that's an expert in the area. Try and go to the number, you know, use the one, 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 one to five, the top five people that you can get to in that particular area and go and ask them, you know, don't make it up. You know, it, it's just go and ask those people. And if they cost money, a lot of people, by the way, for smaller companies will work with you because they know that as you grow and are successful, you know, in my very early career, thank goodness, I had an amazing attorney who developed my divorce papers for my business. Um, you know, you've got to have a great buy-sell agreement. Tell us about that. So what is a divorce paper for a business? You know, it, it can take a number of different forms, but before you get in business, you've got to actually think about, well, what is the outcome if you've got a partner and it doesn't work out? When do you talk about disbursements? When, if you want to buy somebody out, what are the clauses of that? What are the valuation parameters? Who gets what? Um, that has to be well thought through if you're in a partnership or you bringing in money and you've got investors who gets their money first, who gets their money second. Um, if you die, you know, does your spouse get the business? Does it go to your employees? Do you have life insurance? All of those elements are very critical to get right in your formation documentation. Wow. Critical. And don't do it alone. It's, this isn't something that you can cut and paste. Somebody who really understands your business, somebody that understands whether it's manufacturing or whether it's service or whether it's 
um, training. There are experts in those fields that have done this a hundred times. If you're contracting a vendor, for example, and you're investing a tremendous amount of money in a CRM or you know a, a customer success uh, technology, read the fine print because you want to be able to extract yourself. The data that you put into it is your data. You don't want that going to somebody else you know, if something goes sideways. These are the things that often entrepreneurs don't do well and they come back to haunt them. Right, right. Right? That's all the, the whole having a plan, you know, as entrepreneurs, we're excited, we're impulsive, we're, you know, a lot of us will yes. catch the ADHD, we're, we're, we're movers and shakers, we'll deal with it later, we'll deal with it tomorrow, we'll figure it out as we go. Um, and again, we need to be more wise and intelligent. I think the greatest sort of piece of wisdom that I would just sum up in what we've discussed is the importance of of learning and making sure you got a plan and all of these things organized. Like as entrepreneurs, we don't want to be organized, but we have to force ourselves right. to operate within a structure and follow a process and 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 you know evaluate and measure. In some cases, all the corporate stuff that an yes. entrepreneur just wants to sort of feel their way through. And it's okay to feel your way through in the yes, business. Of course. But yes. essentially, you have to evolve and you have to mature and you have to know when to do these things. Uh, uh, build a checklist. Build a checklist of all the basics. And you don't have to do every one of them. Right. You've got a great bookkeeper. They've got their checklist. But you're going to make sure that the checklist is picked off. Yeah. And you can delegate some of this, people. Don't think that this is a burden on you. You want to have fun. You want to love what you're doing. Right. But right. if you're not following the checklist, it's going to come back to haunt you. Yeah. Look, I'm in the next stage of my business now where yes. to that point, I'm now looking to onboard someone that can help head up and drive and develop our sales. So yes. our sales yes. model, right? So I can do this with my eyes closed, but now how do we replicate that? So, And there are people, Greg, that you can find out there. We're, we're very fortunate right now to have this incredible managing director who understand sales, understand how to manage a group of junior salespeople, very metric driven, highly motivated, knows their game like backwards and the results that this individual is achieving yeah. are remarkable. Are they, now, do, are they, are do you they need they to communicate? Yes. Say again? Are they up for hire or are they looking for? No, 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 don't touch them. <laughs> No names, no numbers, Greg. <laughs> All right. Well, you're listening to the show. And <laughs> All right. So I got one more question, and then we're going to take a break. So, look, you're a dude that stays on top of his game. How, what, do you, what do you do to stay on top of your game? What are you doing to learn? What are you doing to sort of grow? What are you doing to, to keep your brain activated and moving and, you know, just yep. succeeding within the role that you're, that you're living now, which has evolved into more, I would say, some mentorship with, with business oh, and, big time. and investments and, you know, yes. management. So, yes, tell us. I think the, the first, the, the big thing for me is staying healthy to begin with. So it's, you know, eating healthy, um, you know, having it some, some kind of exercise regime, you know, because mentally and, and physically, in order to, to be, to get, you have to be mentally and physically strong. Um, relationships have to be clean uh, in all aspects, hopefully in your life, so that that's not a distraction. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, you know, that's more on the personal side. On the, um, on the learning side, intellectually, you know, shout out to you. It's today you can listen to these amazing podcasts, um, business related, you know, that are extraordinary. Um, and you, I learn from literally watching, listening, um, other people. I'm a I'm a I'm a more of an auditory and experiential learner. I do read, um, so I love reading. You know, if you what is, what is so much desk, reading now? Well, you know, right now uh, my Bible I carry it with me everywhere is Traction. So I got to tell you this this book has hit my desk over the last three months at least fifty times from like fifty different people. Um, it's Traction awesome. is, is is getting a a, a lot of a a, a, a lot of um, press and excitement around it and in fact i actually my wife's reading it so her boss gave it to her as she joined the company yes. i'm actually engaging with the client where i actually i've i've gone through a little bit of it but I actually haven't read the whole book and uh so it's sort of here's some thought anyway they powered through it and said okay get the book and come we need to start working <laughs> working together on the book amazing right the other is my partner's book called the boutique yeah, um you gotta send me uh, this, don't you 
Yeah, I, I, it's on its way to you. This this is really spectacular. It's written as a almost like a reference guide, and it's not. It is written for owners of professional services firms, but it's applicable to any entrepreneur. We right. talked about checklists. Let's do a shout out. The book is called. The book is called The Boutique: How to Start, Scale, and Sell a Professional Services Firm. It's by Greg Alexander. It's available on Amazon. It is phenomenal. It's the cornerstone of one of our businesses now called Collective 54. And, you know, I, I literally reference it on an ongoing basis. You know, one of, the, one of the elements of scaling your business and when you get it, Greg, there's 17 key things. We've spoken about a couple, but there are 17 things to do as an entrepreneur if you want to scale your business well. And don't ignore any of them. And they're not that tricky. Right. And then, you know, one that I go back to fairly regularly and I'm, I'm loving it again because I'm a, I love stoicism and I'm, I'm such a believer in grit and determination and hard work. Um, Meditations by Marcus Aurelius. Um, wow. You know, it is superb. Wow. wow, that's a powerful, that's a powerful book, man. It is a powerful book and it's written in a highly accessible way. And if you think about it, you know, it, it was written so many, so many years ago. Right. Um, you know, it, it was given to me by, um, by a fellow YPO who, who sat on the YPO board many years ago. And uh, I love it. You know, it's, it's, I just went back to it recently. And then one that I'm reading that helps me sort of ground myself, and I go back to it as well, is The Power of Now by Eckhart Tolle, who lives in Vancouver. Beautiful, you know, the ability to meditate and just be mindful and just dwell in the moment um, is very powerful. And by the way, there's a couple of chapters that just, it, it, he teaches you a basic, simple meditation technique that takes 10 minutes. It's just about breathing. You can just clear your mind. I find myself so in my mind sometimes, and you know, the mind is, our, is, is sort of, it's, it's really great, but it can also be our biggest detractor. Yeah. Being able just to clear and breathe and take some quiet time every day is powerful, Greg. Yeah, and 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 if you're a gritty, determined type of personality, you forget to do that, right? So forget to do that. I, I I've I've only started to do that later on in life, and it's been a very helpful thing. I wish I do it more. I think uh you know part of my my routine I'm trying to get into is a better uh, routine uh, uh, for that because. It's very important to quiet your mind. You need to look after your mind. You know, I was having this conversation to, yesterday that said, you know, we as human beings have fragile minds and uh, stress. Fragile minds. Ray Dalio, if you know Ray Dalio, yep. one of the most successful investors on the planet, you know, he practices transcendental meditation um, and he's, he's spoken about it. You can Google it. You can see. And he literally, I've, I've been in a, in a, uh, on, a, on a call with him where he credits his success with his meditation practices. Most people that meditate and get into that world actually do. And in fact, a lot of right. very successful, call it athletes, leaders, investors, right. business folks, they, 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 they all rest their mind, right? Yes. Yeah. Good. You know, some people tear off to the beach once a year and get wasted for seven days and then come back and they're like, ah, right? It's not, no, it's not healthy. It's not my thing, right? Right, right. <laughs> hey, don't get me wrong. Beach for seven No, no, don't get fantastic. me wrong. <laughs> we, we Far be it for me to tell you what to do. Right, we need to do that <laughs> and all the other stuff. Okay, we're going to take a break and we're going to move into the final section, which is what we call the Better Human Takeaway. We're going to ask our two signature questions to the one and only Sean. Uh, we're going to see what you have to say. Okay, just before we jump into the next segment, we're going to take a quick little audio break and we're going to hear from our sponsor, the Better Human Program. The Better Human Program is a 10-week program that equips you with the tools to achieve success in every interaction with other humans. Learn assertiveness, effective communication, interpersonal skills, and take control of your life with the Better Human Program. Check out the link below for all the description information. All right, welcome back. We are here in the final section, the Better Human Takeaway. And, uh, you know, this is a section about getting some, some advice, some perspective, some thoughts from, uh, from our guests. And we want to start with the question of, you know, what is the one question I maybe should have asked you today that I, sh that I didn't ask you? So how does an entrepreneur, how, do you, how does one deal with the anxiety and stress of being an entrepreneur? Love it. So let's go there. You know, how do we as entrepreneurs deal with our anxiety and stress? 
that entrepreneurship brings? So I have a really dear, dear, dear friend, almost like a brother to me. His name is Rand Stegen. And Rand um, shared with me many years ago a book by Peter Kostenbaum. Peter has this whole philosophy about anxiety. And instead of, instead of ignoring your anxiety, instead of ignoring the stress, in essence, it's go to where the pain is. Because if, you're in, if you embrace the reality of it, it's manageable if you call it out. You know, if you name it, if you name the, the fact that you're stressed, that it is lonely to be an entrepreneur, that your friends don't understand what you're doing or what it means to carry a payroll. Greg, you and I would, would understand what it means to put payroll on a credit card. Right. We understand what it means to go without being paid. Many, or, many paychecks I've gone. Many and, paychecks. And, or, and I've been scared giving people a paycheck going, fuck, I, I, I just hope the bank lets us check go through. Right. Or, you know, um, paying yourself way less yeah. than, you know, the five or six key people in your business. That's what ownership is. That's what entrepreneurship is. Um, and so it's going towards the pain, embracing it. And it's very, it's easy to say, it's not that easy to do. But I have found from experience, when I go into that, it's like having a tough conversation. If you put off the tough conversation, it just sits here on your shoulders. It sits in the back of your mind. It gnaws away at you. It worries you. It's incomplete business. So going towards the pain, embracing it, that to me is true leadership. That's authentic leadership. And in my experience, the entrepreneurs that do that are the entrepreneurs that are highly competent at getting through it because they practice that. It's a practice. Right. Think of it like a muscle. Right. You know, if you want to, if you want to buff up or you want to lose weight, it's not going to happen by you thinking about it. <laughs> there are things that you've got to do. You've got to eat well. You've got to exercise. You've got to go to the gym or you've got to do your push-ups and press-ups or your stretching. Um, if you want to be treated well, you've got to treat others with respect. These are the foundational things that are just true. They're, they're not myths. They're real. Go to where the pain is, Greg. Love that. You know, and, and, and as you said, it is, the, it is about addressing the fear that you yes. have to resolve the anxiety, right? Awesome. Yep. Okay. What does the word better human mean to you and how do we all achieve this? Yeah, it's such a wonderful question. Uh, and it's so appropriate for the times that we're living in. And I know that probably somebody has said that in every stage, every generation. <laughs> but, you know, there's the, there's the golden rule um, and it's treat others as you would be treated. I mean, let's try and debate that. I've never been able to debate the negative side to that because it's such a foundational truth. And then, you know, we're all human beings. Uh, civility has been lost, Greg, in, in my view. What, what happened to just a healthy debate conversation? You think Absolutely. that's like that and it's okay. Let's be it's still. become so emotionally loaded and it's become a distraction. And my personal sense is we have to have accountability for what we say and how we show up. Right. And I think a lot of my observation is when you lose that accountability, it gives you permission to be a jerk. Right. It gives you permission, your own lack of personal accountability to self-respect and respect for others abdicates the, it abdicates the, the responsibility. And I think we've got to go back to owning what we say owning what we do. And again, it, it's, I don't want to preach, but it is, it, it just, we've been bombarded and we've let our guard down. And I think we've let ourselves down. You know, it's how we treat the planet, how we treat each other, how we, how we've forgotten how to have discourse and agree to disagree. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's going to be, by the way, in a highly disruptive tech environment with AI and robotics and everything else, human beings are not going to go away. Um, it's how do we go back to working with each other collaboratively, respectfully, um, and not do damage? Let's not do damage. There's too much damage being done. I agree. You know, hard work, I think, is a lost art. Uh, accountability and, 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 you know, doing the hard stuff, making the hard decision, doing the, the, uh, uh, making the right call, the right decision, being respectful for people. You listening. Know, listening. Truly listening. 
Right, right. I uh, I just read a book recently. It's uh, not out. I was very fortunate to get part of the manuscript with someone that uh, he's a retired Navy SEAL and uh, talks a lot about sort of stress and uh, incredible. But there was one thing that uh, was mentioned in the book. He talks about something called courageous restraint, which is big. Right. You know, it's it's oh. it's, 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 you know, courageous restraint to not react courageous restraint to to be accountable to 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 operate in everything that we just said maybe we have to do part two to this episode and that would be wonderful it, it, that you know trigger points and knowing your trigger points right you know and then being courageously accountable not to get triggered but that create that needs awareness right. and we've forgotten how to be self-aware and conscious right right and maybe we make excuses for it everyone's running around doing this we do we, we've abdicated and we create excuses right and 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 we do these assessments or we read these books and we go oh i'm self-aware because i know i'm a big d and a little i or a big critical parent and a little nurturing parent and whatever the yeah. language is and then people you know we often say this to people you know don't think you're smarter and you're better just because you've come and done the training course with us right absolutely what you do after the program is what counts the most okay at the end of each episode, we ask our guests for a better human takeaway, a one or two line, uh, a piece of advice, a sort of big learning from today's discussion. Um, Sean, what is your better human takeaway for our audience? What's the, the thing you want to leave them with? I'll start by saying, believe in yourself, believe in others. Grit and determination need to be a cornerstone of how you show up. And then, as my mom always said, I always love going back to my mother. Don't forget your please and your thank yous. Right. right. Manners, 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 man. Some basic stuff. Sean, this is amazing. Where can the audience <laughs> find you? Where can they look you up? Where can they get in touch with you? So you can find me at S-M-A-G-E-N-N-I-S at capital, C-A-P-I-T-A-L, 54.com and find me on LinkedIn, Sean McGinnis. And uh, I'd love to chat with any of your listeners. If you're serious about your life, yourself, your business, I'm into helping. Amazing. Amazing. You definitely are an individual that pays it forward. Sean, this has been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for taking You're me. amazing, Greg. Love what you're doing and uh, looking forward to chatting. Awesome. Uh, all right. If you like today's episode, don't forget to click that like button. Don't forget to subscribe. Don't forget to share. Don't forget to comment. And we will see you next time. Hey, I'm Greg Witz. Thanks so much for coming and checking out the video. If you like that video, you're going to love the next one. So I'd highly suggest that you click this video over here. And don't forget to subscribe and share.